We know there was roughly 200 people on the webcast earlier, so that's a good-sized crowd. I'd mentioned earlier we're, we're trying increasingly to do this to save people from having to travel all the way from Calgary and other places, long trips, unless you're on the committee, of course, and then you still have to come. Um, but anyway, I hope you enjoyed this morning's session. We did try to give you a taste of SMS from other industries in that case. We're going to now, in this afternoon, focus on some of the key elements that you'll be reading about in the SMS. And we brought people who we've had the, the uh, opportunity to see before to try to talk to you and help you understand why we included those and what it might look like in your world. So I think with that, who am I turning over to? To you? It's my, my distinct pleasure to turn over to my former boss, Stacy Gerard, member of our SMS committee and representing the public. Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you, Stacy. I am so happy to be able to be here, A, be on this team, and everything that Ron McLean said about the team is, is true. He wasn't stretching it at all. We're really forged by fire, I think, at this point. And I am very fortunate to have the opportunity to introduce Nick. He he's just goes by Nick. You know, when you say Nick, everybody in the industry knows it's Nick Stavropoulos. Did I say that right? Butcher it? Because um, I was just here, Nick, and Nick, um, Nick is also on our team. But in June 2011, he came to the position of the new executive vice president of gas operations at PG&E. What you hear about Nick is that he is probably the most experienced leader in gas operations in the United States. I don't know about worldwide, but. Um, to take on the topic of leadership, we couldn't ask for anybody more experienced, more sensitive, more focused on safety, and th those are some of the things people say about him. And uh, for those of you on the webcast, you probably can't see, but his shoulders are really about eight feet wide. He stepped up to the plate to probably one of the most challenging jobs we have in the US, so we are so fortunate to have him today on the topic of leadership, my favorite element. Stacy, thank you. <clears throat> wow, I gotta start to work out, I think, right? <clears throat> um, thank you all, uh, good afternoon. My real pleasure to be here with you to talk about uh, safety leadership, and I know that after a few remarks um, that uh, Stacy and Tracy are gonna uh, uh, organize some questions and we'll have a, hopefully uh, a real good dialogue. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, the work that Ron has done to lead uh, this team. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, when all's done, we have to get him a herding cat um, hat, uh, but he's done a, a fabulous job, and Ron, I really uh, enjoyed and learned from your leadership of how to bring diverse groups together and uh, reach consensus on such an important topic of safety within our industry, right? And. Uh, I can remember uh, back on June 13th uh, when I started my first day at PG&E, uh, which was about nine months after the San Bruno uh, incident. And I flew, uh, prior to coming to PG&E, I had run uh, gas operations in the United States for National Grid. So I was responsible for the third largest gas company in the country. We had operations in, in four states, um, had 28 unions, uh, <laughs> Uh, supporting me uh, in that effort, and, and I thought that was a, a, a pretty challenging job. But when I, when I took that plane across the country uh, on June 12th uh, to come from Boston to San Francisco, I happened to have a window seat and uh, just marveled. It was a beautiful day, crystal clear all across the country, and really just marveled at, at, uh, at our great country. And, uh, the terrain, the environment, and then I got to thinking about the 2,500 or so miles that I was traveling and that, you know, my gas pipelines were under terrain like that, right? Uh, in cities and across valleys and under rivers and bodies of water and across desert. And then I thought, you know, um, we have 80,000 miles of this, 80,000 miles, which if you go back to your fifth grade geography, if you wrap it around the world, 
it's three times plus, right? And so that was going to be the responsibility that we had at PG&E to take ownership and responsibility of this 80,000 miles, any inch of which, if it operated incorrectly, could uh, hurt or severely injure someone. So that's sort of uh, my starting point uh, when I came to San Francisco at PG&E. And the very first thing I did um, when I walked in the door to my office, I had a big whiteboard, and right at the top of it, uh, I put, my job is to improve the safety culture. My job is to improve the safety culture. And that's really what I focused on for two and a half years. And I'm going to talk to you uh, about some of the things uh, that I've tried to do as a leader, that we've tried to do as a leadership team uh, at PG&E. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've had to do to demonstrate that, that uh, we just didn't have words, but we've had deeds uh, as well along the way. So improving safety culture. Uh, you know, I, I think we heard from some of the speakers this morning, this is not a light switch, right? This is not a light switch. It's not something that uh, my boss, Tony Early, who's a fabulous boss, by the way, great, great guy, best he's CEO. Listening. He's listening, I hope. If he's not, we're going to send him the YouTube video. But uh, Tony comes from uh, the nuclear Navy, uh, comes from uh, two previous companies that have nuclear operations. And so understands that even though you operate uh, in a very hazardous environment, if you understand the risks and you take the steps necessary to mitigate those risks, you can operate uh, extraordinarily safely. So it's great to have someone at the top of the organization who owns safety. When Tony came uh, two months after I did, he formed the Chairman Safety Council and he brought in our uh, big unions, the IBW and the engineers and scientists of California and put them on the Chairman Safety Council with him to talk about what we were going to do to improve public and employee safety. So it really does start from the ownership and commitment uh, at the top of the organization, which gives me the confidence that Tony, uh, Chris Johns, our president, the board of directors, has my back. You know, when we make decisions to, when we find things and we go out and fix them, I know that, uh, that our board, our chairman, our president uh, has my back and, and my team knows that, knows that as well. Um, I think we really had a, a seminal moment at PG&E uh, when we had really the first opportunity to turn lemons into lemonade. And it was uh, six months after I was at PG&E and really was trying to create an environment where our people felt more comfortable reporting things that were broken, to identify issues and problems. And that was very much uh, not the PG&E culture uh, that existed. Uh, we had a, a something called positive discipline. I, I didn't quite know what that was. Um, but I um, think it's like, you know, you're going to have your cod liver oil and you're going to like it, uh, maybe kind of thing. But we were really trying to change that because what we were finding, people just weren't identifying and reporting problems. And so I would go out to the various locations and evangelize about the importance of, of identifying issues. If we don't know about it, we can't fix it. These are some of the mantras that you hear in, in our company. But... What happened was uh, one of our uh, mapping uh, supervisors, along with a, with a, with a uh, administrator in the mapping area, had identified uh, 17 plat maps out of 22,000 that we had that uh, hadn't been properly leak surveyed. For some reason, it fell through the cracks in the uh, PG&E system. We self-reported that, uh, and three weeks later, we were fined $17 million. So that was kind of a tough thing, right, to have happen when we knew we had problems. The NTSB had issued a report four months earlier, had identified 12 specific weaknesses that PG&E PG had to address, and one of them was records. Lo and behold, we find a problem with records, and we're fined $17 million. So I had a choice to make, right? Was I going to fight this and argue about it? or was I going to take this an opportunity to turn lemons into lemonade? And so that's what we decided to do. And uh, 
made sure we broadcasted a, uh, a communication from me to uh, all 22,000 of our coworkers at PG&E that I was proud of uh, our employee, the employees that called this out. I was proud of the fact that we self-reported. And whether they find a $17 million or $70 million, I want us to do the same thing. And that was a huge moment for us. It was really the first opportunity for people to visibly see that we were changing the way that we went about doing business. The other way we changed business is in my office, I had a giant wall. And on one side, I had a giant picture of a lemon, and the other side, pictures of a lemonade. And we asked people to send me pictures of all the things they found, and we put it on the wall of lemons, right? And it's little things like that that resonate markedly with our people, right? It's the mantras that we have. Find it and fix it is not just words at PG&E, but you can hear it at the lowest levels of the company that they know that's exactly what we're going to do, that's what we're going to try to do. If we don't know about it, we can't fix it is another, uh, another example. When I came to uh, PG&E, another thing that, that I did was uh, uh, certainly understand that I really didn't know a heck of a lot. And so from a leadership perspective, it was important to do what my father said, you know, God gave you two ears and one mouth and use them in that proportion, right? So um, I spent a lot of time listening. And one of the first places I went was to the IBD, IBEW uh, Union Hall in, in Vacaville, California. I was told I was the first senior executive of pg and &E to set foot in the Union Hall. Um, I find that a little bit remarkable. It's the largest IBW local in the country. Um, it represents all of our gas field workers. So one-stop shopping, one place to go. And I sat down with the gas business agents for about four hours. We broke bread together. Uh, and I would say at that first meeting, uh, they really identified probably about 80% of the things that we've worked on to try to improve ever since just sitting in and listening to those folks, they certainly began to get the impression uh, that we were a different leadership team. We were trying to create a different culture. And I go back with my senior leaders uh, about every three or four months, and we sit and we have uh, similar conversations. Um, but now it's changed from all this stuff is broken to you know, how can we prioritize, how can we work better together, so we've really uh, built up uh, the trust factor and we're working together to solve problems. So, you know, real leadership issue is you have to get the buy-in of the people who are actually going to do the work. We can have great procedures, we can have great work methods, we can have great training programs, but if we don't have inspired and engaged employees, whose hands are going to be the last ones to touch that pipe, that valve, or that control, right? Whose mind we need to be thinking about, am I doing the right thing? Do I understand the implications of my work? You know, if I don't know it, do I have the confidence to stand up and say, I don't know how to do this, I need some help, right? That's what we're trying to work on uh, at that level. So really began the process by understanding that, that uh, uh, I didn't know a heck of a lot, and they really helped me greatly, along with our other uh, union, the engineers and scientists of California, who represent uh, my design uh, drafters and mappers, and, and they've been extraordinarily helpful uh, as well. At the suggestion of uh, Chairman Herzman of the NTSB, um, got out of our office, got in a plane, and visited other companies and other industries. And so we had the great pleasure to be hosted by some terrific companies, uh, Alaska Air. Um, we had the chance to see uh, their corrective action program, their non-punitive self-reporting, and what they had done over the previous 12 years to improve the safe operations of uh, their company after they had a terrible uh, airline crash off the coast of California 13 years ago. 
We also went to Norfolk Southern Railroad in Atlanta, Georgia to, to listen to them about non-punitive self-reporting. We went to Tennessee Eastman Corporation in beautiful Kingsport, Tennessee to uh, learn about uh, chemical process safety because what we found was that really was not a concept or a term that's well known uh, within our gas uh, industry. We went to Boeing, uh, we went to GE, um, we've been to Ford. So as you might imagine, we've learned uh, an awful lot uh, from these companies. And so we've brought back uh, a lot of those concepts. And I would say from a leadership perspective, the most fundamental issue that we dealt with as a leadership team was changing this idea that we had to find, if we had a problem, we would previously try to find the person who was responsible for it, rather than really the system that was the problem, right? When you go read uh, the last three or four years of the NTSB's reports, uh, what you find in virtually every single one of those is uh, organizational failure, right? Organizational failure. And what we needed to do is we needed to put in place a non-punitive self-reporting system that we tried to model after, uh, after the FAA's uh, our system, uh, after the IMPO uh, uh, system uh, as well, so that we could create an environment where people could report and they knew that we were gonna try to understand the root cause of incident. Was it the lack of proper tools? Was it the lack of proper training? Um, you know, what is it that really caused that incident? We had a lot of challenge and debate amongst our leadership team. You know, probably nine months of, of challenge and debate. But finally, uh, we had a new set of, uh, of safety principles um, that we adopted uh, with the support of the IBW uh, in the ESC. And we launched that program at the beginning of last year. And we put every single one of our leaders in the organization uh, through uh, new safety leadership training over a six month period of time. So anyone from union crew leader and above that supervises someone went through uh, our safety leadership training where fundamentally we were trying to change and get away from a uh, where we, would, where we would suspend people and fire people and put letters to the file to really an acceptance of it's our problem and we need to figure out and understand the root cause so that we can eliminate it. So that had a huge uh, impact and has really begun to be the basis of uh, significant organizational change. And I feel though, I'm always reminded, I, you know, for those engineers in the room, yeah, you might remember the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, you know, it's really uh, chaos theory, right? That, you know, without uh, proper control, things sort of go off to chaos. And I think that, that safety and commitment to safety is the same thing. It's just an intense effort that needs to be tended to uh, every single day. One of the things that we learned when going out to speak to, uh, to Alaska Air, we went and visited our Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, which is one of the top rated uh, uh, plants in the country consistently, is that, um, is that this takes time, right? It, it's, it's not something uh, that happens overnight. It's something that you need to find out where you are uh, on the maturity curve of safety culture but that wherever you are, if you want to get to a place uh, further right on that curve, it just takes time and commitment. Uh, you need to get out of the office. Uh, you need to get out to the arts. Uh, one of the challenges that we face is we have a seven by 24 operation like all the gas operators in the country and we're incredibly geographically dispersed, right? So, how do you go out and touch that person on second shift in Bernie, California that's responsible for the operation of a major compressor station if you don't get out from behind your desk, uh, get on a plane and get up and go visit with those folks periodically to check in and see how they're doing. So that's a, that's a big part about what we're trying to do. So 
it wasn't just important to have words. Uh, we had to match those words with actions, right? And so we started with the 12 NTSB recommendations that I spoke about, and we really put our mind to uh, begin to rectify those. And so I'm happy to report that uh, nine of them, uh, the NTSB have reported, are closed and acceptable. Uh, three remain open. We expect that uh, those three might be closed by the end of this year. They're open and unacceptable. They're open and acceptable status uh, right now, and they're really time-dependent issues. Um, uh, completing our hydro test work, completing our automated valve uh, installation, and things like that. So we're incredibly proud of the work that our team has done to address uh, those issues. Um, we've also um, invested close to $2.5 billion of shareholder money. Um, that's a billion with a B uh, to do over 600 miles of hydro testing in high consequence areas in the Bay Area of California, uh, increasing by a factor of 20, the amount of transmission pipe we replace on an annual basis to uh, embark on a program to make our lines uh, more pickable. And we've been installing about 75 uh, remote automatically control valves on our transmission network uh, a year. So a really uh, intensive effort. We spent about $128 million uh, redoing our uh, maps and records of our entire uh, gas transmission network, uh, and we, uh, we completed that work, which represents um, about 500,000 separate features with 4 million uh, data fields that are used to calculate uh, the MAOP um, of that pipeline. Um, we've reduced our leak backlog on our distribution system from 12,400 leaks 24 months ago. We ended up with 151 uh, at the end of December. Uh, last year. We improved our emergency response time for our 110,000 uh, leaks uh, that are reported in our system, our odor calls, uh, from uh, bottom of third quartile to top decile. We're now responding in about 19 minutes uh, per call versus 33 minutes uh, per call before. So, you know, we had to have the words and the actions um, and create the foundation, but people also needed to see that we were gonna put our money where our mouth is. Uh, even though we haven't received any funding for this uh, yet, our commitment was uh, to get the job done. Um, another big part from a, a safety leadership perspective was to put in place a corrective action program, and that's where uh, we really looked to the nuclear industry uh, and we really went down and put the Vulcan mine meld uh, on our partners uh, at our Diablo Canyon power plant. And we sat and learned what they had been doing since the inception of the plant to have a system where everything that happens from uh, a, a problem uh, with, uh, with uh, the stairs coming down from the parking lot to uh, a critical item on maintenance having to do with an important part of our nuclear reactor. It gets reported, uh, it gets ranked, it gets scored, and it gets dealt with uh, uh, on a daily basis. Some of it uh, gets dealt with immediately, someone gets put into a maintenance program, and some of it gets monitored. But we put that program uh, in place uh, in September uh, and uh, publicized it, and we've seen an 850% improvement uh, in self employee self-reporting of issues. So we think that's a real big measure of the safety culture that we're trying to uh, put in place uh, in the organization. The other thing we did was we brought in people from the outside to uh, make an assessment. So we do something called the Premier Survey. Some of your companies uh, might do that, but uh, it's a measure of employee engagement. Uh, and we evaluate how we stand from an employee engagement perspective against uh, other Fortune 500 companies in, uh, in all industries. We also brought a company in to do a safety culture assessment so that we can look specifically at the safety culture within our organization and compare ourselves, again, with other companies within our industry and, uh, and other companies uh, more broadly. 
it's a very important uh, part of building uh, a strong safety culture. Uh, you got to know where you are, right? Uh, you you, you got to be able to have the gift of feedback, and it's humbling. You know, I think I think Ron used that word earlier today, right? It's humbling uh, to look at these reports, and in some cases, uh, you're not as good as you think, and so. It really develops and gives a, a, a roadmap. It's kind of like what we heard from the chemical industry: the importance of having, um, the importance of having, you know, independent assessment. Well, we feel it's important to have an independent yardstick to assess uh, how well we're doing. And I guess the last thing that I would share is we really tried to adopt the Plan, Do, Check, Act principles. Uh, of the safety management system uh, that the team has developed here. And uh, we didn't have an SMS that we could look to uh, for our industry yet, uh, but we wanted to get going. Um, so we looked to something called uh, uh, publicly available uh, standard 55, uh, PAS 55, which has now morphed into ISO 55000. Uh, we embarked on that journey two years ago, and we have the independent assessors uh, started on Monday, and that audit will run through April uh, to determine whether or not we are certified under the asset management um, uh, standard PAS 55. Uh, we did a self-assessment uh, two years ago and under all the clauses of, of that standard and found uh, many significant deficiencies and have been working really hard uh, to get those into a better place. In talking to the independent assessors from uh, Lloyd's Register in London, when I had them out uh, back a few months ago, we're really talking about the safety management system work that we're doing here and said, you know, one thing about PAS 55, it doesn't have a safety culture clause. And we really feel that we need to have a safety culture clause in our SMS system. And, uh, and Bernie, my, my uh, uh, my assessor from, from, uh, from Lloyd's, who has assessed uh, the asset management work at over 30 of the largest uh, uh, energy uh, and transportation companies in the world, said, Nick, what I can tell you is um, that it's going to be very hard for you to obtain certification under this standard unless you have a good safety culture because you need to have a good safety culture to demonstrate competence in all of the elements of a good asset management program. Plan, do, check, act, right? Know your assets. Understand their condition. Understand the threats that impact those assets. Understand the mitigation measures that you can deploy against those threats risk rank all that, incorporate that work into your capital and operating budgets, and then check to see if you accomplish what you set out to accomplish if you hadn't changed your course to do. So that's, that's underway. Um, we hope to be the first ISO 55,000 certified uh, company uh, in the country by mid-year this year, and we'll be, uh, I think, the only gas company in the United States if we're, if we're lucky enough to obtain PASS 55 certification by that period of time. So uh, in closing, this has been uh, the most remarkable uh, and rewarding leadership challenge of my lifetime. Um, uh, I don't wish it on anybody. Uh, I, I got to tell you, uh, it's been a real challenge. Um, dealing in an incredibly toxic environment. Um, this was a horrific accident. Uh, eight people were killed, 35 homes destroyed, uh, a whole neighborhood, right, lost, right? So um, I try to put myself in the shoes of, of, of those folks that, that had to endure that awful experience. And that's really what drives me every day. That's what drives my team every day. I've been fortunate. I've been able to recruit some of the top gas people uh, across the country. I've recruited people from 10 states, Canada, the UK. Uh, we brought in some of the best uh, gas talent from all over the world, uh, from the Netherlands, from uh, Germany. Um, and uh, it's been 
incredibly rewarding for my entire leadership team to have the opportunity to try to make sure that we're operating uh, a safe pipeline. You know, we only run and operate 2% of the transmission pipeline in the country, uh, but we operate 10% of the high consequence uh, pipe in the United States of America. So we know we have a uh, very important obligation uh, that we need to address. And it begins by those words that I put on my whiteboard the first day when I walked in the office, right? You know, my job is to improve the safety culture uh, at PG&E. And hopefully uh, we've been able to make a difference. So thank you. Thank you, Nick. At this point, what we'd like to do is open up the floor for not only questions, but also conversation. One of the great things that uh, I've experienced in working with Nick uh, over the last year or so is his uh, candor and compassion and commitment to these. And, it, and one of the ways that he demonstrates it in my experience is, is a willingness to, to share his experiences, the, the easy ones, the difficult ones, the, uh, the challenging ones. So at this point, please come forward and Let's ask see. questions or uh, engage in discussion. And say who you are. Oh, and apparently I'm supposed to say who I am. I'm Tracy Scott with, AP, with the API Working Committee. So I'll start off. Uh, Linda Darty with PHMSA. You know, Nick, we know that transitions are difficult. I mean, you, changing human behavior is, can be a monumental challenge. I mean, every one of us knows that we shouldn't text or talk on the phone while we drive, but how many of us do it, you know? So when you're looking at changing behavior as far as reporting and giving people the confidence to make those calls, you're going to get to some people, you know, the people at the early, the early adopters. How long does it take to turn that ship around and get everybody on board? Well, I wish I had a more precise measuring stick on that, but it, it really is interesting in, in my visits with Alaska Air and these other companies, um, you know, Alaska Air, I recall, you know, said it's going to take five to six years before they got to the point where they felt that, uh, that everyone was on board. Uh, you know, I think in talking to other companies and other industries, they, they talk in terms of five to ten years to go from wherever you are. Uh, to wherever uh, you want to be. As Don mentioned, uh, every company has a safety culture. Um, could be a bad safety culture, could be an okay safety culture, could be a, a great safety culture. But you can even see in some of these chemical companies that have been at this uh, since, what, 1984, they're still pushing the envelope on continuous improvement and challenging on, on how to get better. Uh, DuPont came in and spoke to our committee and it was just uh, fabulous uh, around uh, talking about, hey, they bring new employees in and they don't have the DuPont safety culture. Well, they have to learn that. They acquire companies that don't have the DuPont safety culture. Well, they have to bring them on uh, and learn that. I think, I think it was quickest to get um, our field workers bought in. Um, I think the biggest challenge is in the middle. Uh, and so I'm trying to work down through the organization and I'm trying to get my, uh, my uh, partners with the IBW, Tom Dalzell, who's just an amazing partner. He's president of uh, the IBW local in California uh, to help me push uh, from, uh, from uh, the bottom up. Uh, so the, the middle uh, is really where uh, a lot of time and attention needs to be spent. Because they are the ones that are, are you know, our, our mantra is safe, reliable, and affordable. And uh, I think it's the first line supervisor, uh, the manager that sort of feels that tension uh, feels that tension the most. Thank 
can you take that just a little further and tell us, so how do you approach the guy in the middle? And they've probably been with you, those guys in the middle of the longest and predate Nick. So how do you get to them? Well, um, I think that's where it's a journey. Uh, so a couple of things uh, that we really focused on was first off the targeted safety leadership training for these people to uh, make sure that they understood that we wanted to go about leading safety in a different way. And we tried to have an officer at every single one of those leadership training sessions so that they could see firsthand that it was a commitment and it just wasn't words. We also uh, put our first line supervisors through three weeks of training um, and we update that periodically and we build into those uh, workshops uh, this notion about how to lead uh, and how to improve uh, safety culture. And also uh, that we make sure that employee engagement is an important part of their scorecard. Uh, so, uh, incentive compensation, uh, we have 40% uh, of our incentive compensation is tied to safety goals, um, public safety and personal safety goals. Um, we have another piece that's tied to employee engagement. So, when you really look at it, over 50% of our compensation is, is directly tied to safety or employee engagement. Another big piece is customer satisfaction. So it's, it's sort of backing up uh, the, the words with how they're going to get compensated. And I think that has a positive impact as well. How long has that been in place? We put the, um, we put the, the public safety elements uh, into our incentive compensation two years ago. And this will be the third year where we've had public safety as a significant portion of incentive compensation. Question? One of the questions that I have, Nick, is can you, can you speak a little bit about um, the changes at the executive table. So from, from when you first joined to, to today, how have, how have the conversations changed? How has the agenda changed? How has the decision making changed? I think um, one of the things that Tony brought to the company was a more rigorous uh, strategic planning, long-term planning process and we uh, really pinch from GE, uh, their model. Uh, we all went out to Crotonville and had a visit with them and, and really to understand, you know, how they go about uh, developing their long-term plans. A uh, big part of that is uh, uh, understanding risk. And I think that was probably the biggest leadership change to uh, get everyone on board that it was critically important to really understand uh, the, uh, that our assets, what we operated, the condition of those assets. Uh, it was kind of what Don said uh, earlier, you know, I think today it was not, not company A that, that had mitigation strategy uh, X or company B that had mitigation strategy Y. He was worried about company C that didn't even look at their assets to come up with any mitigation strategy at all. And I think uh, that has been the enormous sea change within our operations. So it's not just gas operations, but it's electric operations, it's, it's uh, power gen. Um, we've radically upped our game in terms of identification of risk, risk quantification, um, using that risk quantification to inform capital and operating budgets, develop long-term targets for risk reduction, uh, having risk uh, as an important part of our conversation. Uh, I think that was um, uh, the, the element that was impacting most. It's easy to get 
people's heads around uh, zero lost time injuries, right? You know, uh, we don't want any of our workers to be killed or hurt. Uh, it gets more complicated when you're talking about uh, public safety issues, I think, especially since um, even when you look at national data, uh, the frequency of events is um, not huge in mathematical terms where you can develop statistically reliable models to drive your decision making. And when you boil it down to sort of regional data to get things that happen uh, frequently, that's really hard to, to, to really mathematically quantify. So to get people's heads around, how are you gonna deal with these preventing events that have never happened before, right? And the nuclear folks have done a great job at that, right? They don't wait for things to happen. Uh, they're trying to predict what's happening in the future. They're, they're working on, you know, beyond design basis work right now, right? So they've designed plants and they're saying, we're all designed up for these conditions. And now they're asking themselves questions, okay, what if we were wrong? And what if even worse things could happen? Worse than we already thought, right? So they're, they're you know, they're addressing those and dealing with those. This question has come um, over the internet. What do you believe is the impact of improving a safety culture and the impact on the bottom line of the company? And is it expensive? Well, I look at this as a marathon, not a sprint. And when you think about uh, what it's gonna cost PG&E when all said and done with the San Bruno incident, uh, could be north of $4 billion, right? So um, that's expensive. Um, putting aside the human catastrophe, uh, which is incalculable, right? So, um, but I think when you look at the companies that have the safest operations in any industry, uh, they have the most engaged employees. They have the highest levels of customer satisfaction. They have the best safety results. And they have the best financial performance because it turns out that in order to do things in the safest possible way, you understand well in advance what you need to do. You make sure that you have qualified people to do the work that they know what they're doing, that they're trained, they've got the right tools, the right equipment, the right material. Uh, you eliminate rework, you do it all run once safely. In the long run, uh, I think it's just, you know, no question, it's the absolute way to go. Oh, we've got a question. Oh. Thanks. Uh, 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 I just want to thank you, Nick, uh, for the outreach that your uh, your company has done, and the learnings that they've shared with the rest of us in the industry. Uh, the uh, yeah, you, your people have been j just tremendous in that regard. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Vern uh, Vern Meyer with Trans Canada Pipelines. Um, the one question I had, I guess, around the management system side of things there, though, is uh, um, how have you, as a as a senior management team, uh, been able to uh, address the uh, the multitude of information that you get uh, from your operations and the various indicators and kind of sort through all of that uh, uh, critical data uh, to find the, you know, the salient points that really tell you whether the, uh, the programs that you're putting in place uh, are, are in fact achieving the results that, uh, that you desire. I know, I know it's been a challenge for us. We've uh, you know, historically relied on lag indicators. We've introduced many, many more leading indicators uh, but again, it's uh, it's really you know cutting through all of that uh, chief and and being able to concentrate on that critical uh, critical information that really tells you what's going on at the front line, and that you are moving the needle internally. Uh, if you could share something 
with us on that, I'd, uh, that'd be terrific. Yeah, I, I would say from a maturity curve perspective, we're, we're, we're way on the, the left-hand side of that. We, we've got a, a, a lot of information that we're analyzing and gathering uh, more than we ever have before. And I think we're still in the early phases of learning how to sort through uh, all of that. I know what we've done is we've broken up into uh, eight asset families within our gas operation. And we've tried to um, uh, analyze lots of data to understand what we own, the health of those assets, that sort of thing. And so I can see the maturity of that year over year has improved greatly. But I would say we're in the very uh, early stages and probably could learn from, uh, from you and, and other companies that have been at this for, uh, for a lot longer. We do, we, do, um, we do shamelessly go to our colleagues in a nuclear part of our business because they've been at this for a long time as to how you think about data, how you sort data, uh, what, what indicators are uh, tell you the most, so we, we're we're very much in the in the in the learning stages. One of the issues that we've seen other industries wrestle with uh, that we've begun to talk about is this issue of empowering an employee to stop work when they see an unsafe condition, and in your company in particular, where the issue of stopping work could impact gas supply in a critical way. How have you dealt with that issue? So, um, you know, we talk about trying to empower uh, every employee where uh, they can stop work at, at, at any time. Um, you'd like to think that 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, people are gonna handle that in a proper fashion. So. If you don't understand, don't know, I think it's more about, it's great to ask questions and, and, and do reporting. But that's been the struggle, and I think it goes back to the question that Linda asked about the, the middle layer of management uh, being comfortable that uh, anyone can ask a question. And, um, you know, is that right? Should we be doing it that way? Um, and then also, some of our more experienced people uh, being willing to hear the questions from some of the less experienced people. And that, that's an issue as well. You know, how do, how do we, it's, that was all part of our safety leadership uh, training that we've begun to roll out that, you know, as a leader, even though you've been doing this work for 20 years, uh, sometimes new people with a different set of eyes and a different point of view um, might shed light on things that you never thought about before. So trying to uh, help people open their minds, I think. So that m makes me think that you might have either informally or more formally identified competencies in leadership. Is there, um, are there characteristics that you lay out in the training that you say you think are qualities of a good leader or has it has it gotten to that level of detail so we, yeah we so i think you know a lot of companies have their uh, leadership principles and we're no different um, i think uh, the the uh, only thing that that's been a little bit different for us uh, from a safety perspective is we've specifically called out you know these sort of actions that we need you to act uh, need, you, need you to emulate when it comes to safety issues. So you do call them out. Yeah. You guys will keep my eye out there. Mike? Oh, good, Great. thank you. Technology. The first question is, how has Six Sigma or other process improvement tools been incorporated in PG&E safety culture? How do you jumpstart senior management? We've got a few questions here. What is your training for senior leadership? And did training start at the top or middle and then up? Would you like to see that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Multi-parthite question. So, yeah, yeah. you know, where did the training start? Um, we started the safety training uh, at the top 
uh, and we made sure that uh, the leadership team was bought in uh, and uh, that we had everybody on board, uh, that we conducted workshops uh, amongst our officer team. And then we rolled it out to, um, to, as I said, the rest of the leaders. And those workshops were all mixed. So you could have uh, directors and managers in with union crew leaders uh, in those workshops. And we had an officer uh, attend virtually all of those uh, safety leadership uh, training sessions. So started at the top and then we made sure that, and, and that was great to have, uh, you know, we had people who might have been working in the accounting area or in the office and with an electric uh, crew leader, and it was good for everyone to hear, you know, what goes on. I think, you know, one of the, uh, one of the slides that was presented today, the importance of headquarters understand the impact that they have um, on field operations. So that's what happened there. Um, so what's our training for senior leadership? So I think I sort of just described that. And, um, you know, Six Sigma tools, not so much in safety culture. You know, we, we really haven't used, uh, you know, Lean or, or Six Sigma or a workout or any of that uh, for uh, safety culture issues. You know, we use those tools in selected places for, you know, process improvement, continuous improvement. Uh, but it's really focusing on specific safety culture surveys that we do by geography, by level, by line of business. Uh, you know, I know uh, from the recent uh, safety culture survey that we conducted, uh, recent uh, uh, survey that we conducted, I, you know, I've got, a, I've got a problem in a particular area of a region, you know, uh, that's an outlier. So uh, something that we talked about as a leadership team day before yesterday that we need to do something about, but we don't use, we don't use uh, Lean or Six Sigma around safety culture. We're just about out of time. I have one more question from, um, from our online viewers. And uh, I wonder if there's any additional questions from the audience here. All right, I'll read this question for you, Nick. How do you see the difference in the SMS between operational and maintenance aspect of the safety culture, looking at lagging indicators, as opposed to the integrity management asset aspect of executing white what might turn out to be leading indicators. Well, that's interesting. I mean, we really struggled with that, right? How to how to incorporate integrity management into uh, into the SMS, uh, and uh, I, I think that that's something that uh, together uh, we're all going to learn uh, on this journey as to how the integrity management principles that have been widely adopted by the industry and how they're going to evolve. As we uh, as we deploy uh, this SMS system, so I think probably a question will go unanswered for now. I think we're just uh, just about done time. Nick, thank you so much. One of the one of the conversations that we've been having with the uh, with the recommended practice committee is the power of sharing and from learning from each other and and people having the courage to speak up and share their successes and their challenges and certainly um, making yourself available and sharing the way you did is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Well, thank you. And, you know, um, if I haven't said it, I meant to say it, you know, uh, uh, many people in this room, uh, many companies uh, across the country, Canada, other parts of the world, um, regulators, uh, officials have been enormously uh, helpful to, uh, to PG&E, uh, the time uh, that you have uh, uh, given us to open up your doors, allow our people to come look at your companies and understand what good looks like uh, has been uh, tremendously valuable uh, for us. And we thank everyone uh, that's helped us and, and we're helping, happy to share, um, you know, in a, whatever small way we can provide to tell you what we do as well.